Hello, this is Eric Wierson with Newsweek magazine. I just got done speaking to President Irfan Ali. He came here to New York to commemorate the fact that Guyana is now the president of the UN Security Council. Guyana became a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council in the beginning of the year. And he's here to talk about his initiatives related to food security and climate change. But more than that, the president and I spoke about Venezuela, we spoke about energy markets, and Guyana's rising role in the global diplomatic community. Here are a few excerpts. Thank you, Mr. President, for sitting down with Newsweek magazine. We're really excited that you're here in New York and excited to talk to you about your agenda. Uh, you're here in the city to commemorate not only Guyana's being elected to the UN Security Council, a term that's going to run through 2025, but this month of February, Guyana is assuming the presidency of the UN Security Council. And this coincides with your recent ascension to the chairmanship of CARICOM. And of course, the country's growing role in both regional and global matters is unmistakable. First, I'd like you to, big picture, reflect on this moment for Guyana and its international standing, both for Guyana as a whole, what that means for the people of Guyana, and for you personally as the leader of this emerging diplomatic player. Well, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'm very pleased to be here. Always good to be in your company. Uh, we are playing a very important role uh, regionally and globally now as a country. But this role is not hinged or crafted in the oil and gas box alone. We have, uh, throughout the history of our country, stood uh, on the side of justice. We have uh, worked relentlessly to be part of a world that is fair, fair to all the stakeholders and participants in the global community. And this requires, of course, uh, just leadership. It requires a just system. It requires a system that speaks to the importance of the rule of law, uh, speak to democracy. We ourselves had challenges uh, when previous government tried uh, to use undemocratic principles to derail an election. So we understand how these principles are important. And that is what shaped our regional outlook and our global outlook. But because of where our country's position and the type of natural resources that we are blessed with, it gives us particular advantages. We are, of course, known as the gateway to South America. But we are also very much a part of the Caribbean CARICOM mechanism. When you look at the size of the market that we have access to, then you understand how a small populated country, but with huge land mass, can play a more integral role in the key areas of concern for the global community and the regional community. And what are these areas? Climate and environment. We live today in a world in which climate and environment is playing an important role. Uh, it's occupying a lot of policy space, regionally, globally. And we want to present Guyana as a leader on climate and environment that is building a country that exemplifies great leadership, fast, uh, uh, you know, fast forwarding mechanism, um, and also creating a framework through which everything we do is crafted in the low carbon development frame. That is the least impact on the environment and deploying our forests at jurisdictional scale to be part of the global solution on energy, on uh, climate and environmental matters. Then we have food security. Because of the vast expanse of arable lands and fresh water, we are an important stakeholder in ensuring food stability, and stability from a price and supply perspective, and food security for the region, and then globally. 
So in that capacity, we want to ensure that Guyana is playing a key role in the leadership on food security, climate security. And of course, on energy security, we want to position Guyana as an important regional and global hub in the supply of energy, both from uh, oil and gas, but also looking at our renewable potential and feeding our renewable capacity into a system that will allow us to be an integral part in the regional energy security and energy mix. So these are the things that are that is driving us. But to do all of this, we have to ensure that we have a human resource asset base that is highly skilled, highly competent, and one that can match the aspirations of the country. That is why we're investing heavily in the education system. And of course, as you have a higher level of earning and greater prosperity in the country, more educated people, your healthcare system has to be upgraded because they will all demand higher level of service. So these are some of the things that we are addressing in the immediate, uh, uh, in, in this time, this is short time. I understand that tomorrow you're going to be hosting a high-level debate about climate uh, and food security. And what do you expect to be some of the concrete sort of outcomes, or what do you, where do you hope that that conversation leads the Security Council and maybe the greater UN going forward? So one of the challenges we have is in areas of conflict and, uh, and wars, very limited attention is placed on the long-term issues. For example, the impact on food the impact on the environment, the impact on arable lands, the impact on the displacement of people. You have uh, uh, tens of millions of people who are displaced in the last decade alone. Tens of millions of people who are displaced. That leads to greater concentration of refugee camps, lead to health issues, issues of food security, vulnerability, inequality. So they social injustices. So when we look at conflicts and wars, we pay very little attention to the damaging effect, the long-term effect. So there is no allocation of resources or there is no system that allows societies to be rebuilt, that allows structures to be rebuilt, that allows the environment to be regenerated after these conflicts and wars. In our own region, if you look at the cost of conflict on Haiti, internal conflict, not only a democracy issue or a governance issue, that the, the conflict has led to poverty, it has led to malnutrition, it has led to the uh, destruction of the environment, the exposure of the country to a more damaging effect of climate-related events. So, but, the, but these issues are not given the type of attention that it should be given because the focus is on the war itself, how do we end the war? It's on the, uh, how do we get uh, a ceasefire in Gaza? How do we get, well, in Gaza, how do we get food in for the people? Uh, how do we restore water? But what about the damage to the environment? What about the long-term uh, effect of all the people who will be displaced? How are we going to fulfill their needs? How are we going to ensure the system uh, responds to these uh, effects of war? Then, of course, you have the transport and logistics that affect the cost of food. Look, the war in Ukraine was not only, uh, and that continues, is not only between Russia and, and Ukraine. The cost of fertilizer went up globally. That created inflationary pressures on small economies, that created, uh, affected the competitiveness of the agricultural sector. It affected the productivity uh, of the agricultural sector. And ultimately, it created a tremendous hardship on farmers across the world. So we want to use this period of uh, our presidency to not only highlight the effects of conflict and war and the immediate action that is required globally, but for us to bring to the fore the consequences on the environment and food security that are ultimately critically integrated and linked 
into the prosperity of people and their ability to live a comfortable and rewarding life in the future.